Santo Victor Rigatuso, aka Bob Harris, aka several other names for legal purposes, is the kind of guy that comes to my mind when I think of the 1980s. An eccentric, fast-talking grifter, with a never-ending supply of new schemes, and the compulsion to constantly talk them up as if they were the greatest thing ever. Infomercials, fake gold chains, MLM marketing, paper credit cards that were really just coupons. But perhaps the most interesting thing associated with them is a lost 1985 film, entitled Blood Circus, a movie in which aliens come to Earth to challenge wrestlers to wrestling matches, but then they eat the wrestlers. Initially promoted as an incredible two-hour sci-fi wrestling motion picture that would gross $200 million, its premiere would be attended by three people, two critics and one of the extras. Subsequent screenings of the film were not much more successful, and with no luck finding the distributor, the movie was shelved, and eventually believed to be lost forever. However, evidence that still exists has emerged over the past few years including a known working copy of the original film. So for this video, let's see if we can find Blood Circus, the lost sci-fi wrestling extravaganza. This video is sponsored by World of Warships. Do you like boats and blowing stuff up? Well, boy, do I have the game for you. World of Warships is a free-to-play game for PC where you use boats to blow stuff up. There's new content released every month, including new ships, new nations, cosmetics, and even ship classes. And you can always count on a new experience in World of Warships' stunning 12 versus 12 arenas. World of Warships has more than 40 unique maps with dynamic weather. Each one has been updated with stunning new water effects and textures. It's like you're staring at the actual ocean. And there's multiple ship classes to choose from, including some of history's most iconic battleships, destroyers, aircraft carriers, cruisers, and submarines. They've also done some wild collaborations, including Godzilla vs. Kong, Transformers, and even one with the band Megadeth. And they've got another one going on right now. From November 16th to the 30th, there's an in-game collab between World of Warships and the anime series High School Fleet. And World of Warships isn't just for PC. You can also play on Xbox, PlayStation, and on your phone. Just click the link in my description to start playing World of Warships today. And during registration, be sure to use code HSF2023 to receive a huge starter pack including 200 doubloons, 1 million credits, 7 days of premium account time, and 2 high school fleet commanders. Once again, that's the link in my description and use code HSF2023. Blood Circus is a film that I just know would be one of the greatest, so bad that they're good, horrible movies of all time. If only we could just see it. The reasons my hopes for it are so high is because, as I mentioned before on the channel, the best so bad that they're good movies are the ones that come for one of two reasons. Either its creator had a grand artistic vision that they were just too inept to pull off, or because the creator only cared about making money. Well, Blood Circus was a movie that was tied to a company that sold fake gold. And as Santo Victor Rigatuso said about Blood Circus, the film won't make sense, it will just make dollars. So how does one even come to be a guy who makes fake gold chains in pro wrestling sci-fi movies? Santo was born in Baltimore in the 1940s, where he was bullied in school for his Tourette syndrome. He drops out in ninth grade to take over his deceased father's barbershop, beginning a lifelong habit of serial entrepreneurship. It's actually said that he was a great barber, but eventually he converts the barbershop into a record store. And after a while, he sells the record store and shifts his focus. By now, it's the 1980s. The FCC lifts its ban on program-length advertisements, which ushers in a golden age of infomercials. All of a sudden, you got the Flowbee, Ginsu knives. All kinds of crap is sold on late night TV, and Santo sees this as his opportunity to make some real money. So he goes and he buys himself some late night TV time. And he begins with his first infomercial product, a set of two watches. They're supposed to play the song The Yellow Rose of Texas, and you get a man's watch and a woman's watch. And believe it or not, people actually buy this crap. So much that the watches actually sell out. But when people receive the watches, they find out that there's something wrong. You see, the woman's watch doesn't play the song. In reality, the watches weren't broken. He had always intended for just the man's watch to play and for the woman's to be quiet. Al Bundy would be proud. But obviously there's a lot of complaints about this, but he actually manages to get away with it by changing the name of the company, something he wound up doing a lot. But with no more watches to sell, he moves on to his next product, Santo Gold. 
Santo Gold was said to be pure 24 karat gold chains and bracelets made with Santo's specially developed process. This process? Coating a much cheaper metal with an extremely thin layer of actual gold. And despite this once again being obvious crap garbage, it's selling. Enough of it that Rigatuso is amassing a small fortune. A fortune which would then be used to fund his next venture. So in 1985, Rigatuso begins taking out ads in the newspaper promoting his upcoming film. Blood Circus, the incredible sci-fi two hours wrestling motion picture. It's expecting a $200 million gross. The major studios are invited to battle it out in the ring for the rights to this movie. And you can order a free 10 minute preview on Betamax or VHS. The description of the movie reads like something out the side of a Dr. Bronner soap bottle. Aliens, real blood, heads landing in popcorn, fleas, Santo Gold wearing 30 pounds of gold, yada yada yada. And it concludes with Rigatuso describing his reputation. The press calls him Barnum, others Houdini for doing the impossible. Watch for his name, he usually becomes the biggest of what he does. Other than the millions being spent on TV, Newsweek and USA Today, etc. have recently mentioned Blood Circus. Uh, citation needed. I mean, also, there's a hotline to call where you can listen to the sounds of Blood Circus. Little is known, though, about what actually happens in Blood Circus, other than the general plot. You get aliens from a planet called Zoran. They come to Earth and they challenge wrestlers from the USA and the USSR. Unbeknownst to the wrestlers, though, when they lose their matches, the aliens eat them. But we can get a little bit more information about the movie from Rigatuso's infomercials, which began to promote Blood Circus. And judging by the scatterbrained nature of this one infomercial, if the same mind was behind Blood Circus, you know it's a masterpiece. The infomercial opens with a masked wrestler holding on to another wrestler's decapitated head, which he then tosses into an old lady's lap. And remember, this is being aired on network television. Then we're treated to some of the in-ring action, including wrestlers getting hit by lightning bolts, glimpses of some of the finest outer space special effects you've ever seen, and a singer that resembles Douglas Levison in aviator sunglasses. You are everything that's gone wrong in this world. I want Bob Dylan up on stage. Who the fuck are you? Blood Circus is coming soon. Be sure to ask your local movie theater when. Ask your local movie house for a free screen bag. What's a screen bag, you might ask? Screen bags were these paper bags, I guess, to scream in? And printed on them was more info about Blood Circus, which are referred to as a commotion picture, featuring the brand new technologies 3D Sound Santophonics and Thunder Vision, which will shatter your seats. Alright, scams aside, how can you not love this guy? Like, they really just don't make carnies like this anymore. There's also a poem about Blood Circus written on the bag, another Dr. Bronner-esque masterpiece. Maybe I'll do a dramatic reading of it on my second channel, Wang Uncut. Oh, and also, you get a coupon for a free diamond ring that they assure you is real and not counterfeit. The infomercial then goes on to tell you that Santo Gold is a lot like pro wrestling. Which, I mean, knowing what we know about how Santo Gold is made, it's kind of an accurate description. We're also informed that there's a real rock and roll singer named Santo Gold. Not to be confused with the singer Santa Gold, who, by the way, Rigatuso would eventually sue over her name. This Santo Gold guy, the big rock star, that's of course Rigatuso himself. Well, later on in the infomercial, he'll be performing his song, also called Santo Gold, along with some more clips from the film. But for now, let's just heed the goodwill message for today. Say something nice to the very next person you see. Better do it. I'll know. The next 15 minutes of the infomercial are just about how and why you should buy Santo Gold, and also how you could become a Santo Gold salesperson yourself. Sounds a bit like an MLM scheme, but they assure you that one person made $3,000 in a single day of selling Santo Gold. Clearly, you'd be a sucker to pass up such an amazing opportunity. And then finally, the time has come for the rock and roll singer Santo Gold to hit the stage and perform his amazing song for his adoring fans. His song, of course, is about what else? How you can buy Santo Gold, what amazing quality Santo Gold is, and how it has a money back guarantee. Tell me it's just not stuck in your head right now. While he's singing, angels look down from heaven and talk about what a great singer he is. And then they tell a joke. Oh, by the way, do you know why the pregnant lady went into the pizza parlor? Was she hungry? No, they had free delivery. As promised, cut into the performance are scenes from the movie, most recognizably featuring the wrestler Ox Baker, as well as wrestlers from the Southwest Championship Wrestling promotion. 
You also got wrestlers bumping on what is apparently a boxing ring with no give whatsoever. It's a lot more dangerous than a normal wrestling ring. And that was just one of the many reported problems with these scenes. So the wrestling scenes for Blood Circus were shot at the Baltimore Civic Center. It's a venue that was no stranger to wrestling. They'd have events from WWF and WWWF before that. And this movie shoot was promoted as a wrestling event that you contend where a movie was being shot. So people paid to be an extra in this movie, with numbers reported anywhere from $9 to $20. And if you look online, there's several accounts floating around for people who claim to be in the audience that night. You might be shocked to find out that they didn't get exactly what they were expecting. I was actually at a filming of a wrestling match that was supposed to be used in Blood Circus. It was at the Baltimore Civic Center, as I recall. I went with my friend and we took my Super 8 movie camera. A pair of rent cops confiscated our roll of film. Fortunately, we had another stashed away and shot that one, this time being a little more discreet. The audience was the usual unwashed kids and grannies at a low-rent wrestling event, and man were they pissed when it turned out to be a sham. It was advertised as a wrestling match slash come be in a movie event. Long pauses while nothing happened, with people screaming for blood, with local announcer Charlie Ekman trying to move the non-existent show along. There were aliens, bad dummies as I recall, lowered from the roof to suck the brains slash blood of wrestlers. There were fake severed heads tossed about. My favorite part was a wrestling tag team named the Cryin' Blondes. Hit them and they cried, which they indicated by spinning slash rubbing their fists in their eyes, baby style. All the while, Mr. Santo himself ran around with a bullhorn, looking exactly like Phil Spector. A great night. Still have the film somewhere, I guess. And the reports of the long pauses, people being angry about the long pauses, and just the general chaos of the night in general are consistent among these reports. But ultimately, despite all the problems, eventually they get everything they intended to shoot. The movie is completed, and once editing is done, Rigatuso begins to seek distribution for the film. The premiere, as I mentioned in the intro, reportedly only has three people show up, two movie critics and an extra. And after two years of failing to find the distributor, in 1987, Rigatuso decides he's just going to do it himself. So he rents out a few theaters in Baltimore over the course of a week. It's unclear how many people actually attended, but it was nowhere near enough to make up the cost of the film, and in all likelihood not enough to make up the cost of renting out the theaters. And thus, Blood Circus gets shelved indefinitely. Some thought the film was simply destroyed after this, while others believed it was among the items confiscated when he was arrested for mail fraud in 1989. You see, his various scams had finally caught up to him, and boy were there a lot of them. Santo Gold itself ran into trouble in 1985. See, one of their methods of making sales was using cash on delivery. They would just send cash on delivery packages to random addresses containing Santo Gold. There would be a label on them that said, you ordered this from TV. Which, clearly they didn't, but in theory some people are gonna see that and there's gonna be like, Oh, yeah, I guess I did it, I just forgot about it. Whoopsie daisy. And boom, they buy it. Free money. Obviously, this is extremely not legal. And it just so happens that one of these packages winds up at the home of the Pennsylvania Postal Inspector. And then he had another one that very closely resembled the Nigerian Prince scam. He claimed that an anonymous millionaire had recently died and he was giving away his fortune in $2,000 chunks. And you could have one of these pieces of his fortune for, you know, a small processing fee. Of course, the people who paid the processing fee would either wind up getting nothing at all or they would get a package full of junk that was supposedly worth $2,000. And then he got the one that ultimately led to his arrest. He had a company called the Credit Card Authorization Center. The idea was it would help people who didn't have the best credit rating get a card from something like Visa or MasterCard. And you just have to pay a fee up to $50. But then once again, they'd either receive nothing, or they'd get paper credit cards that could only be redeemed for products in Santos' catalog. When this all finally comes to a head, Rigatuso winds up spending 10 months in prison, and nothing would be heard of Blood Circus for a very long time. Not until 2001. In 2001, Santo Gold creates a website that's selling a one-hour Making of Blood Circus DVD, describing it as the most incomprehensible, bizarre, and of course note that bizarre is spelled not like something strange, but the place Aladdin shops. Funniest wrestling movie ever made, with many actual scenes in the movie, Blood Circus, Please click contact us above or below. Thank you. Rated N and E for nuts and everybody. Hey, it's guys like me. Oh, yeah, and he also announced his new song entitled You're Fired, which is of course inspired by Donald Trump. This could be heard on his YouTube channel along with other songs like Vietnam for John McCain 
and Obama Stomp. To my knowledge though, nobody actually got the one hour making of DVD. But there'd be another update in 2008. The official Santo Gold website, breaking news. The actual Blood Circus Masters and 35mm negatives, first full length 35mm wrestling film reported lost for 23 years, have now been found and limited license rights are now available for executive producers to come forward and contact us. There can only be one Elvis Presley, one Walt Disney, one Einstein, one Houdani, <laughs> and just one Santo Gold. Oh, and he's also promoting a talent search where you, yes you, had a chance to be seen by millions by joining Santo's Top 10 Hall of Fame. He also added a statement about learning from his mistakes, claiming that the reason why the Santo Gold product had the problems it did was that he hired manufacturers who couldn't handle the job, and also that his employees stole cash and threw away the orders. It's also worth knowing that around this time, you have a bunch of edits to the Blood Circus Wikipedia page, made by someone named Jetrack843, who writes an awful lot like Santo, and is trying to make the page include info about his lawsuit against Santa Gold, and also about Santo's new music. And a couple of years later in 2011, an eBayer also named Jetrack is selling the Blood Circus reels. They have a starting bid of $21 million and a buy it now price of $750 million. You might be surprised to find out it did not sell. But in 2013, the reels would be up for sale again, this time by a different, more established eBay user. They claimed it was in extremely good condition and was acquired minutes before being tossed in a landfill. This time, the bidding ended at $222.50. This was below the reserve price, and therefore, once again, it did not sell. The next year, in 2014, this seller would go on to privately screen the film at the Alamo Draft House in Austin. This was proof that what they had was legitimate, and they'd relist it in 2015, this time with a buy it now price of $3,499. The sale ultimately ended, saying the item was no longer available. And the last known whereabouts of this print pop up on the Lost Media Wiki forums in 2020. A user named ZX the Proto mentions coming in contact with the person who ultimately purchased this print from the eBay seller. This anonymous person was willing to let ZX's group scan some of his rare movie prints, but not Blood Circus, likely due to its rarity and value. You see, from a collector's perspective, if you have this thing that's one of a kind, super rare, never been seen, that's worth a lot of money. As soon as the general public gets to see it, your investment is suddenly worth nothing. But ZX mentioned that perhaps this person will change their mind at some point. So now we know what happened to the movie, what happened to Santo Gold himself? An obituary surfaced claiming that Santo Victor Rigatuso died in 2015. The birth date, abundance of alternate names, and the fact that he did at some point live in Winter Garden, Florida all match up. However, both his website and his YouTube channel have been updated since his supposed death. With the release of an unrelated film also called Blood Circus in 2017, the site was updated to reflect that this is a different movie. And in 2019, a video was uploaded to Santo Gold's YouTube channel saying the following, We are the owners of Santo Gold's Blood Circus wrestling movie. We want everyone to contact us and let us know who wants to see it. Visit www.santogold.com. Please fill out our contact form. It's worth noting that at this point, they never speak in first person. So it's possible that Santo did pass and these are simply people carrying on his legacy, which at the bottom says copyright 2021 Santo Gold, and still charmingly has that 90s style mishmash of keywords at the bottom to try and game search engines. So where does that leave us? We know that the film is in excellent condition, and it's in the hands of a private collector, but this collector isn't willing to let people see it right now. And we also know that either Santo Gold or people carrying on his legacy are trying to find a way to distribute the movie finally. And with all that being said, I just have to wonder, of all the ways he could have tried to expand his gold business, why a sci-fi wrestling movie? I mean, at that period in time, in the 80s, you did have a bit of a wrestling boom. That was the rock and wrestling era. A term that, by the way, Santo claims to have coined himself. I also wonder if the idea of doing a sci-fi wrestling movie was inspired by the luchador who shared Santo's name. That, of course, being El Santo. El Santo was a Mexican wrestler who starred a lot of movies where he'd battle aliens and all sorts of monsters. And I mean, according to a person connected to the film, who spoke anonymously to Brian Last on his 605 podcast, surprisingly, Santo actually was a really big wrestling fan. And with that in mind, you look at Santo Rigatuso, how he carries himself in those infomercials. He looks like a wrestling character. 
He acts like a wrestling character. He even stretches the truth like an 80s wrestler. Looking at you, Hulk Hogan. In another life, I could absolutely see him killing it as a pro wrestling manager. Perhaps this movie was really his way of taking his newfound wealth and using it to live out a long lost pro wrestling dream of his. Thinking about it that way makes me want to see this so much more. The late 90s were a time of great cultural change. It was the age of Mountain Dew and Nu Metal, Jerry Springer and South Park. It was a time when society, for the most part, got together and agreed to take all these high-minded moral values and throw them in the trash. It was time to revel in the filth of human existence. And somehow, of all places, this massive cultural shift that was going on seemed to concentrate and in some ways was inspired by the greatest sport on earth, professional wrestling. But not everyone was happy about the direction American culture was headed in. So for this video, let's talk about the World Wrestling Federation versus the Parents Television Council. We gotta save the children from the evils of pro wrestling. I mean, if I think about it, when I was growing up, pretty much all the trouble that I ever got in had to do with wrestling. Walking around like bushwhackers. Locking my teacher out of the classroom so I could elbow drop another kid. My teacher getting scared to make me go to the principal's office because I said my mother's boyfriend is the hitman. She was a big fan of Brett the Hitman Hart, but the teacher thought I meant an actual mafia hitman. Well, you know, kids do dumb things, and at that point in time, it was more just individual parents getting annoyed by shit their kids are getting into because of wrestling, and not so much an organized movement to completely deplatform wrestling. But that would all change when the Parents Television Council came around. But to properly tell the story of WWF and the Parents Television Council, we must first take a look at the beginnings of the Attitude Era. In particular, the feud between Bret Hart and Stone Cold Steve Austin, where the whole thing really began. So in late 1995, Steve Austin comes into the WWF as the ringmaster. He's a part of Ted DiBiase's stable, the Million Dollar Corporation, who really had their best days behind them. And it puts Steve Austin, one of the greatest stalkers in the history of wrestling, in the role of having Ted DiBiase as his manager, who is also one of the best talkers in the history of wrestling, but it keeps Steve Austin from fully being Steve Austin. Throughout 1996, Steve Austin finds himself embroiled in a feud with Savio Vega, who was robbed of his rightful victory over Mabel that prior year at King of the Ring 1995, forever cursing the future trajectory of the World Wrestling Federation and pro wrestling as a whole. In May of that year, the feud culminates in a Caribbean strap match between Steve Austin and Savio Vega at a pay-per-view In Your House Beware of Dog 2. This match has the stipulation that if Steve Austin loses, Ted DiBiase must leave the WWF forever. So, Steve Austin loses on purpose. Not only does this move free up Austin to speak for himself and fully be Steve Austin, it also sets him up to be a new kind of heel. You see, growing up it always seemed like there was sort of a camaraderie among the villains. The good guy wrestlers were friends with the good guy wrestlers and the bad guy wrestlers were friends with the bad guy wrestlers. But Steve Austin had no friends. He was purely in it for himself, to hell with anybody else's alignment. He was a guy who would just as soon betray an ally as he would help out an enemy as long as it all served his ultimate goals. The last time I could remember seeing anything like that was Bad News Brown, who in a lot of ways was Stone Cold 10 years before Stone Cold was Stone Cold, and who coincidentally also had one of his most memorable moments with Bret Hart, this time at WrestleMania 4. During a battle royal at WrestleMania 4, Bad News Brown and Bret Hart form a temporary alliance and act like they're gonna share the prize. But Bad News Brown, of course, double-crosses Bret Hart, causing Bret Hart to have a big tantrum and destroy his trophy. Bad News Brown and Stone Cold Steve Austin were very similar guys, but this time it was different. Because you see, when I was a kid who liked Bad News Brown, that was weird. I was a weirdo for liking Bad News Brown. But when I was a teenager who thought Stone Cold Steve Austin was a fucking badass, everybody else was on board with me. I remember it so vividly being in school during Stone Cold Steve Austin's rise and all the kids talking about who their favorite wrestler was. 
It seemed like almost every single one said their favorite was Steve Austin, but at the same time, everyone seemed kind of surprised that everyone else said Steve Austin because it kind of felt like it was a thing that we weren't supposed to be doing. Stone Cold was the bad guy and you're not supposed to cheer for the bad guy. And you contrast that to his nemesis, Bret Hart, who was the squeaky clean, family-friendly face of the WWF throughout the early 90s. During the rise of Stone Cold, Bret Hart is on a hiatus, and eventually Stone Cold starts calling out Bret Hart over and over again, and finally, he comes back, and he's just as popular as he ever was. But still, it's clear that during this time, Bret Hart is returning to a WWF in which the landscape has changed dramatically. Bret is still super popular, but at the same time, they're fighting, and just as many people are cheering for Stone Cold, who at this point is still officially the heel in this rivalry. And although Bret repeatedly beats Stone Cold in the ring, Steve Austin seems like he's constantly winning the battle of which guy is cooler, which in pro wrestling really is the whole game. And this all culminates in what I believe to be one of the most pivotal moments, not just in the careers of Bret Hart and Steve Austin, not just in the history of pro wrestling, but really in the history of American culture as a whole. A no disqualification submission match at WrestleMania 13 with the special guest referee, the world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock. And at the end of a grueling 22 minute bout, Bret applies the sharpshooter to Stone Cold. Stone Cold, low on energy and with blood dripping down his face all over the mat, struggles to break the sharpshooter. He has a brief glimmer of hope, but ultimately he just cannot escape the move. But he refuses to submit and holds on as long as he can before ultimately he passes out unconscious. Despite Steve Austin not having actually given up, Ken Shamrock has no other choice but to award the match to Bret Hart. And then it happens. In a completely uncharacteristic move, Bret starts to beat down his unconscious opponent. He's awarded a course of boos from the crowd in attendance until Ken Shamrock stops him. Finally, after the beatdown, Stone Cold awakens to a standing ovation from the audience. And just to be sure that Austin isn't suddenly Mr. Nice Guy, he turns around and gives a Stone Cold Stutter to the referee who was just trying to help him out. He limps back to the locker room as the crowd chants his name, and in that moment, everything has changed. To me, this moment encapsulated everything that was going on in American culture at the time. That whole goody two-shoes routine, fuck that, we don't want that anymore, it's bullshit, it doesn't speak to us. And thus, we go from the era of nice guys doing nice guy things to the era of Val Venus getting his wiener chopped off. Big boss man tricking Al Snow into eating his own dog. The era of puppies and Triple H fucking a corpse. And while decrying the fall into degeneracy of both the WWF and American culture as a whole became part of Bret Hart's character, it was also the larger cultural conversation that was going on in the real world. And as pro wrestling's ratings exploded during this time, so did society's criticisms of it. Take for example, Phil Mushnick of the New York Post. Throughout the 90s, even prior to the Attitude Era, Phil Mushnick published several articles critical of the WWF. Often, these articles focused on the WWF's questionable labor practices, which is absolutely something worth looking into. But as the Attitude Era went on, Phil got more and more into simply pearl-clutching over content, criticizing the fans themselves, in fact, coining the term Degeneration X when referring to the kinds of people who might watch wrestling. And what would really bring this conflict to a fever pitch would be when Jim Cornette famously went on Monday Night Raw to directly address Phil Mushnick. It was in response to a particularly inflammatory article following the death of Brian Pillman. This promo basically made Phil Mushnick public enemy number one of wrestling fans worldwide. But at the end of the day, even though he was a total fucking wiener, Phil Mushnick was just a guy with a platform and an opinion. And although he did at times criticize companies for daring to work with WWF, he was not engaged in a full-fledged attempt to completely deplatform them. Enter the Parents Television Council. The Parents Television Council, as you might assume from the name, is the ultimate won't someone please think about the children organization. 
Founded in 1995 by conservative activist L. Brent Bozell III, its stated mission was to restore responsibility to the entertainment industry. How would they go about restoring responsibility to the entertainment industry? By petitioning the FCC to issue fines and censor things, and by engaging in letter-writing campaigns against companies' advertisers. Just legions and legions of soccer moms threatening boycotts. They justified their existence by pointing to an increase in sex, violence, and bad words on TV. And they actually would sit and count the amount of bad words on certain shows. And they were probably correct in saying that these things were increasing, but... Okay? Like, who cares? Not everything needs to be for your kids. And through all this, they maintained that they were perfectly fine with adults being able to watch mature programming. It was just that they wanted to make sure that children's programming was safe. So they started off by targeting such children's programs as Married with Children, Spin City, and CSI. But they weren't all negative, they did have a Best Of Award that they award to 7th Heaven basically every year. So the Parents Television Council is getting their bearings while WWF is transitioning into the Attitude Era, basically growing up with their audience. Although at this point, the children of Hulkamania were mostly either teenagers or even in their early 20s, the Parents Television Council maintained that this was programming aimed at children. And thus began perhaps their biggest censorship campaign to date. It begins in mid-1999 with the debut of WWF Smackdown. And thus their letter writing campaign against all of their sponsors begins, and it's actually effective at first. Coca-Cola drops, Domino's Pizza drops, AT&T drops, and finally, WWF says, okay guys, I guess we're gonna tone down SmackDown a little bit. Having to bend the knee to these kinds of people probably killed Vince McMahon on the inside just a little bit. See, Vince McMahon is not an ordinary CEO. Vince McMahon is the type of guy who at 70 years old decided that he was gonna write himself out of the story to get hip surgery in real life by taking an F5 from Brock Lesnar. He's the type of guy who got himself into a lifting contest with world's strongest man, Mark Henry, and truly believed that he would win. He's the type of guy who gets mad at himself for sneezing because he thinks getting a cold is a sign of weakness. Imagine a guy like that being made to kiss the ring of some nerd who looks like Dr. Zayas. You know Vince McMahon was not just gonna bow down so easily. At first, Vince McMahon just responds to the PTC with a letter. Thanks for getting on our ass. Now I'm gonna get on yours. He goes on in the letter to tell them that they're anti-American and they just need to lighten up a little bit. I imagine that whoever it was at the PTC that read this, they kind of looked at it, chuckled, and threw it in the fucking garbage. Content in believing that they've won the battle. Little did they know, incurring the wrath of Vince McMahon would be a very, very costly mistake. But for now, things would just be a little bit silly. WWF introduces a stable with the purpose of parodying the PTC called the RTC, or the Right to Censor. They would often go on PTC like tirades about the offensive content in WWF, try to cover up women's skimpy outfits, or remove weapons from hardcore matches. And it's important to note that throughout this whole time, we're in the middle of an election year. We got George W. Bush versus Al Gore. And at the time, WWF is running a campaign to reach out to the youth and try to get them to vote. It's called Smack Down the Vote. And this leads to a situation where The Rock is at the Republican National Convention, and you know who else is there? One L. Brent Bozell III of the Parents Television Council. Here's what The Rock had to say about that. We don't portray murder. We don't portray uh, rape or robbery or anything like that. And we're certainly tame compared to what you can see on other network uh, television shows and other cable television shows. As far as for Mr. Bozell's comments, uh, you know, regarding uh, uh, that, that someone in the Republican Party must be on drugs for inviting The Rock. Well, if, if freedom of expression is a drug, then I su certainly suggest Mr. Bozell should try a little bit of it. And wouldn't you know if The Rock's appearance at the Republican National Convention would also draw the ire of Phil Mushnick. While the Republican Party ostensibly stands for good old-fashioned family values, its special guests during its presidential convention were none other than the leading action figures of the World Wrestling Federation, an organization practiced at wearing its sweet, civic-minded mask when needed, but that's long been in the business of popularizing degenerate acts. 
that the Republican Party was able to escape widespread and lasting ridicule for embracing the WWF during a presidential convention is evidence of a news media that is either sorrowfully blind to the WWF's content or, in the case of television news, co-opted by their network's investments in pro wrestling. Two Mondays ago, as the Republican National Convention began in Philly, Vince McMahon's WWF staged a nationally televised show in Atlanta. It featured its usual pornographic, hateful, and violent performances that have made it so attractive to children, young adults, and now, three months before a presidential election, to the Republican Party. At one point, a group of barely clothed, large-breasted WWF women paraded outside the George Dome in a mock demonstration. They encouraged onlookers to chant, Save the Hoes. Hoes is street for whores. Little boys now reflexively refer to little girls as bitches and hoes in large part thanks to McMahon and his national TV enablers, which now, incredibly, include NBC and CBS. Thank you for the explanation of street lingo, Mr. Mushnick. It's also worth noting that Al Gore's running mate during this election was one Joe Lieberman who you might remember from the early 90s war against Mortal Kombat and violent video games and who, surprise surprise, was a member of the Parents Television Council. So despite the Smackdown the Vote initiative being a non-partisan effort, the WWF couldn't help but take a few jabs at Joe Lieberman. In particular, Jerry Lawler saying during a match on commentary that Lieberman would be at home right up there censoring things with the right to censor. This was a moment that some inside the Democratic Party thought might have actually helped George W. Bush secure the election. And although that might sound silly on its face, considering how close that election was, how influential wrestling was at the time, and how attacked wrestling fans felt by the forces of censorship around them, it's very possible there is something to that. But I always knew that Joseph Lieberman was up to no good ever since that day I saw his face in Game Pro magazine. Either way, we were in the thick of one of history's most contentious presidential elections, and it was around that moment that the Parents Television Council would make their fatal error. Allow me to take you back to the case of Lionel Tate and Tiffany Eunuch. You might not remember their names, but you probably remember the headlines. A 13-year-old boy accidentally kills a little girl that he was babysitting by imitating wrestling moves that he saw on TV. This was big news at the time, and it fit perfectly into the Parents Television Council's narrative. And you better believe that they were quick to capitalize on this, putting this in their letters to advertisers. One such correspondence was published on their website when they were trying to get MCI WorldCom to pull from WWE. Bear in mind, our outrage over WWF SmackDown is fueled by the fact that 3 million children weekly are treated to heavy doses of violence, racial stereotyping, foul language, graphic sexual innuendo, and sexist comments. Moreover, a portion of SmackDown airs during the traditional family hour, a time when impressionable children are most likely to be watching television. Are these MCI's values? And if you're confused by the term family viewing hour, allow me to explain. Family viewing hour is a period of time, the first hour of prime time, in which only family-oriented content is allowed to be broadcast. This only ever actually existed in any kind of official capacity from 1975 to 1977. It ended in 1977 because it was deemed unconstitutional. And despite the Parents Television Council campaigning to bring back family viewing hour, it has never existed since. In essence, appealing to a company to recognize family viewing hour is like trying to get a company to close for Festivus. It's not a real thing. The correspondence goes on. Wrestling shows are having a deadly impact on our children. Four children have been killed by peers who are emulating wrestling moves they learned by watching programs such as WWF Smackdown. Four children aged 14 months to 6 years old had their lives cut tragically short because of the effect wrestling had on their peers. Police reports, attorneys for the defendants, autopsy reports, and victims' families point the finger of blame at the wrestling industry. 
that purposely targets children as an audience. And that right there is where they fucked up big time. Let's take a look at the autopsy report. Six-year-old Tiffany Eunuch did not die as a result of children's horseplay, but likely from a brutal, sustained beating, according to the Broward County Medical Examiner. If you remember this story when I brought it up before, you probably went your whole life thinking that this little girl really did die because of a wrestling move. Because, you know, the truth just isn't as catchy of a headline. But according to the autopsy, this was something far worse. A deliberate, brutal beating by a troubled kid. This was absolutely, in no way, something that could have happened by accident because of a wrestling move. Yet, either due to ignorance or a callous disregard for the truth, the PTC persisted. L. Brent Bozell went on to publish an article entitled, Brent Bozell to WWF, You're on your back and the count is two. I guess the WWFE has learned the hard way just how painful it is to be smacked down by responsible corporate advertisers. As the chairman of the PTC, I claim full responsibility for an educational campaign that tells the truth about SmackDown's raw, sexual content and violent programming that is marketed directly to the children of our nation. Vince and Linda McMahon can malign the PTC and me personally all they want. They can make all the legal threats against our organization they wish, and their supporters can continue their death threats against us. But the PTC will continue its campaign to convince corporate America that it has a national responsibility to turn away from such violent and sexually explicit programming aimed at children. He went on to list 37 advertisers who as a result of their efforts removed their advertisements from WWF programming. Some of these advertisers included Slim Jim, Chef Boy RD, the United States Army, Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard, all of which WWF had worked with closely. Well, at this point, we were well behind simple mockery and angry letters sent by Vince McMahon. On November 9th, two days after the election came and went and the entire country was entrenched in a debate about recounts and what the hell a hanging chat is, WWF filed a lawsuit against L. Brent Bozell III and the Parrots Television Council, which in the document is referred to as an extremist organization. The suit charges them with tortious interference, product disparagement, copyright infringement, libel, among other things. It claims that the list of advertisers that supposedly withdrew from WWF SmackDown was falsified. Not only that, the list of advertisers was published without any of these companies being made aware. It also alleges that both advertisers and retailers were lied to and threatened that they would be labeled by the Parents Television Council as not family friendly. It also stated that the Parents Television Council was actually registered as a fictional entity owned by the Media Research Center and they were running a donation matching scam that was defrauding their donors. And to hammer home the nature of the Parent Television Council's grift, they pointed to the Parent Television Council's marketplace, an affiliate marketing thing that they had set up where they would receive a percent of purchases. Some of these stores included Toys R Us, which sold WWF toys, and a greeting card company that sold sexual greeting cards. Like, any kind of sexual thing you could think of, it was on a greeting card. You could buy a gay, straight, masturbation, orgasm, greeting cards, and each purchase would put some money in the coffers of the Parent Television Council. And perhaps the most important part of this lawsuit, it pointed out that in the Tiffany Una case, the idea that her death was caused by a wrestling move was completely rejected by the court itself. The Parents Television Council responded by filing a motion to dismiss the lawsuit, citing the First Amendment, to which the judge responded, the First Amendment does not protect statements that are false and defamatory even if they are made in the context of a public debate about issues of general concern. A court date was set, but ultimately this case would reach a settlement in July of 2002. The agreement reached was that the Parents Television Council had paid the WWF $3.5 million. In addition, and probably what was even more satisfying to Vince McMahon, Brent Bozell agreed to meet personally with the advertisers who were lied to, and 
he would write a personal letter of apology to the WWF. I can only imagine that Vince sat there and just came over and over again reading this letter. To this day, he probably has it saved somewhere special. But all that being said, although justice was served and this was a costly mistake for the Parents' Television Council, in the grand scheme of things, not much would be changed. Ultimately, the WWF, now the WWE, would clean up its act of its own volition, ushering in the PG era. Although they've kind of pulled back on that a little bit more recently. I mean, I guess you gotta spice things up with AEW in the picture now. And good old Phil Mushnick is still up to his old tricks. Although he has, in the time since, expressed regret for directly insulting wrestling fans, he still does things like go after HBO for daring to air a documentary about Andre the Giant. And as for the Parents Television Council, believe it or not, they're actually still around. These days, they're more focused on streaming services. Did you know that each episode of The Witcher contains a hundred instances of adult content? You mean The Witcher that has a game where you win cards for fucking? I never would have guessed. Truly a valuable service being provided here. September 27th, 1986 was one of the most tragic days in music history. While traveling through Sweden on tour in support of their most recent album, Master of Puppets, Metallica's bus skidded off the road and flipped. Their bassist, Cliff Burton, was ejected through the window. The bus fell on top of him and he was crushed, killing him instantly. Cliff was a musician who was regarded as one of the best bass players in metal. So when the band was ready to get going again, those were some big shoes to fill. Ultimately, Jason Newstead would wind up taking the role that he would hold for 15 years. But he wasn't the only candidate at the time. You know who might have been a good fit, though? That's right, Hulk Hogan. Yeah, the wrestler Hulk Hogan. There's actually a few different versions of this rumor out there that Hulk Hogan almost joined Metallica, mostly spread by Hogan himself. Of course, the Hulkster has been known to tell a tall tale or two. Like the time he said in an interview that he was rocking a 10-inch python, only to have to elaborate in a court of law while wearing his best business bandana, that he was referring to the character Hulk Hogan, and that the man behind the character, Terry Jean Balia, was a bit less well endowed. And does Hulk even play bass? Well, that's where the story gets kinda interesting, and there's more to it than you might think. So for this video, let's take a look at Hulk Hogan in Metallica. I've said it before on this channel, but there's just something about guys that were big in the 80s. They were just incredible liars. Not in the sense of just, you know, making themselves look better or smoothing over inconvenient truths, but in the sense that the tales they come up with are often so much more entertaining than actual reality. I mean, look at Frank Dukes. Dude makes a bunch of stuff up, tells Black Belt Magazine, and boom, they turn it into Bloodsport, one of the greatest movies of all time. And this characteristic of 80s guys goes double for pro wrestlers. Perhaps due to the fact that, especially back in those days, wrestlers had to live with one foot in fiction and one foot in reality. And also perhaps due to substances that wrestlers were known to partake in in those days. And all the history of pro wrestling, there's few who can weave a yarn better than Hulk Hogan. There's just so many famous, hilarious Hogan lies. Like how in an episode of MTV Cribs, Hogan claimed that Andre the Giant died a few days after he body slammed him at WrestleMania 3. I wrestled Andre the Giant with these boots on, and then a couple days later he passed on. These are my favorite pair of boots. Which took place in March of 1987. Andre, of course, continued to wrestle long after that, with his final match occurring five years later in December of 1992, a month before he died out of nowhere from congestive heart failure. Or how about his claim that he wrestled 400 days in a year? Despite, you know, there's not 400 days in a year. Supposedly these extra days come from him flying back and forth to Japan, because you know how the time zones work. Except, you know, that's not how time zones work. You don't just get extra days because of them. I'm having flashbacks to that bodybuilding.com thread where they can't agree on how many days in a week there are. There's just so many of these stories. This guy on Twitter, Alan Cheapshot, had a pretty comprehensive list of all of them about a year ago. And actually, it's some kind of weird synchronicity. While I was working on this video, Wrestling Bios released a video going over a lot of Hulk's wild claims. It's a good channel, definitely worth checking that video out. But there's something that's specifically fascinating to me about the story where Hulk Hogan claimed that he was almost in Metallica. And looking into this story led me places that I did not expect. You know, when I was a kid, I was a big Hulkamaniac. And also, for some reason, I thought he sang his own theme song, which obviously he didn't sing his own theme song, that was Rick Derringer. 
But you know, Hulk Hogan was the guy during the rock and wrestling era. That clip of him playing guitar in front of fireworks is an all-timer, so you know, let's hear him out. The Hulk Hogan and Metallica story really starts picking up steam in January of 2012. It was at this time, speaking to The Sun, that he says, I used to be a session musician before I was a wrestler. I played bass guitar. I was big pals with Lars Ulrich, and he asked me if I wanted to play bass with Metallica in their early days, but it didn't work out. By the time Metallica forms in 1981, Hulk had already been wrestling for a few years. He had already finished his first run in WWF, and now he was dividing his time between New Japan Pro Wrestling and AWA. This would also be around the time he was working on Rocky III, so you can see why he wouldn't want to have a band on top of all of this. But the idea that Hulk Hogan almost played in Metallica, let alone was asked to join Metallica by his friend Lars Ulrich, even though it didn't happen, it's a shocking revelation, people obviously had questions. These questions were answered on April 10th of 2012. This was when Metallica's drummer Lars Ulrich called into the Howard Stern show, and he had this to say, You know what? I'm blessed or cursed, depending on how you... <laughs> I'm not even gonna not even gonna subject you guys to my Lars Ulrich impression. You know what? I'm blessed or cursed, depending on how you look at it, with having more or less a photographic memory for pretty much anything that I've been a part of, Lars replied. That one, when that showed up two or three months ago, I was scratching my head over that one. Unless he went by I don't know, Hulk Hogan? I don't know enough about him. I'm not a huge wrestling fan. Unless he went by like his Christian name or something. I don't know if anybody knows what his Christian name was, Dave Smith or something? If there was a whole thing that we had with him under a different name, but I certainly have no recollection of doing anything with Hulk Hogan. Well damn, that's a very different story from being a big pals with Lars Ulrich. I mean, he even claims he has a photographic memory and those not know you. So after this comes out, the response from Lars is all over the place, and people start to heckle Hulk on Twitter over it. And if you're getting annoyed by the haters, he clarifies a bit. Now he's saying that when they were looking for a bass player years after they began, his agent called to see if they wanted him on bass, and he never got a reply. Which is a very different story from the one that popped up that January. The subject doesn't really get talked about again until 2014. This is when he speaks about the situation in an interview with Noisy. He talks about how during this time the pro wrestling schedule was crazy and was starting to wear on him. Which is understandable, I mean, 400 days in a year is a lot. And somehow, this leads to him trying to get into the Rolling Stones. I always still loved music. I was in the UK for some award show, and Jerry Hall, Mick Jagger's old lady, was walking out with me to present this award. I heard her talking on the phone to Mick about, oh, you gotta find a bass player, and you've only got two different choices. I went, what? She had already told me that her kids are big fans, and she wanted merchandise, so I was like, alright, let's reel her in. I was like, look, I used to play bass. I know all the Rolling Stones songs. Tell Mick if you guys need a bass player for the Rolling Stones, I swear to God I could show up. I could rehearse one day and play everything they play. Please tell Mick, please tell Mick. I got home, sent her all the merchandise, never heard a word back, right? So then, I heard that Metallica needed a bass player, and brother, I was writing letters. I made a tape for myself playing and sent it to their management company. Kept making calls trying to get through. I tried for two weeks and never heard a word back from them either. I would have quit wrestling to play in the Rolling Stones or Metallica like that. I was hoping for a call from them, but never got one. All the haters were like, you never auditioned for Metallica. Of course I did, but I tried. Interestingly, this account of the events is almost exactly the same as something he said in 2009 that got much less attention. During this time, Hulk was on tour promoting his autobiography, and he had told this version of the Metallica and Rolling Stones story almost word for word to the Chicago Tribune. So why he at some point told a different story that was in the sun, I have no idea. For all anybody knows, maybe they wrote it down incorrectly. But then I'm thinking about this story and Hulk Hogan's reputation for embellishing things a bit, and I start to wonder about his qualifications as a bass player. I mean, after all, he mentions being a session musician. If you don't know, like a session musician, that's basically the best of the best. You gotta be really good because people are paying you to get in the studio, record the song perfectly as quickly as possible, and get out. The more time you take to get it perfect, the more it's costing your client, so you gotta be on point. So surely there's gotta be some recordings of Hulk playing bass that we can listen to. Well, in the same interview with Noisy, he talks about a band that he was in called Ruckus. Before your rise to fame in the wrestling world, you had a passion for music. Can you talk about the early days when you played bass in a rock and roll band called Ruckus? Oh god, well, that was my last band. I had been on the road for 10 years, and I was a studio musician in Atlanta, a century artist. 
I started out playing guitar in junior high school because I wasn't a big sports guy. I was into music and had long hair. So I started out playing guitar and as things go as a music kid, you start playing in bands. All of a sudden I got in a really good band playing guitar, but then this different really good guitar player came along and this guy was really great. I had a choice, leave the band or start playing bass. So I chose to become a pretty darn good bass player. Now this story is 100% believable to me because I was thinking Hulk seems like more of a guitar player than a bass player and this right here is the origin of so many bass players. When I was in high school there were like 5 or 6 good bands and I got all the good people out of these bands and into one band called Ruckus. I got the lead guitar player from Todd Rudgren's band, I can't remember some of the songs he did like Hello It's Me. Unfortunately though there don't seem to be any recordings of this band around. Although the band seems to have done well, they didn't really tour, a factor that Hogan cited as a reason why he ultimately chose wrestling over music. And in fact, it actually was this band Ruckus that would get him involved in wrestling. In the Noisy interview, he mentions that wrestlers did sometimes show up to these Ruckus shows. He was afraid to talk to them because they are very protective of the business in those days, but eventually he works up the nerve to talk to Sir Oliver Humperdinck. And he asks Humperdinck about being a wrestler. So Oliver tells him to come down for a tryout, but then Hogan breaks his leg. And that might have been it for the Hulkster had it not been for another chance encounter, this time with the late Jack Briscoe. In an interview with WrestlingPerspective.com, Jack spoke about how he met Hulk Hogan. So Jack's out partying one night as he did a lot at the time. He meets these two women at a club and they're telling him to come with them to go see this band that they really like. That band, as you probably guessed, was Ruckus. And as soon as Jack Briscoe sees Hulk Hogan, he's blown away by his luck. I walked into this place and standing there was Hogan playing guitar in a band. Goddamn, if I had that boy, I could become rich. So they went on break. During the break, I came over to him at the table for a beer. He was just so impressive. He was only like 21 years old at the time. I couldn't believe my eyes. I asked him, did you ever think about being a wrestler? It's what I always wanted to do. I'm a big fan of yours and I've been watching you for years. It's what I always wanted to do. So Jack has Hulk meet him at the Sportatorium the next morning and the rest is history. And from Jack's recollection of events, we can tell that at the very least, Ruckus was good enough they had women at clubs dragging men to go see them. But you know, no recordings of this band that we can hear. But there are a few other Hulk Hogan music projects that you can listen to. If you're familiar with any of these projects, likely it's the Wrestling Boot Band. It's 1995 and Hulkster is out there spreading his wings, going into all kinds of new ventures. We're in peak pasta mania era Hogan. So he gets together with his friend Jimmy Hart who wrote a lot of the theme songs for WWF and WCW and they get to work on an album called Hulk Rules. Judging by the fact that he facepalmed when the noisy reporter brought up Hulk Rules, it's not the work that he's the proudest of. That being said, I do think there are some legit bangers on this album. I mean, I really like the song I Wanna Be a Hulkamaniac, which bears a striking resemblance to Owen Hart and Coco Beware's theme song that Jimmy Hart actually wrote. This one's got like a really funky bass line, but it sounds like a synth bass, so I don't think Hulk played on that one. They do have the song, however, Hulksters in the House, which they released the music video for. And in the video, Hulk is playing bass. And it does sound like a real bass. So this one he probably did play for. And you know, the song is tight, but nothing special. It's also worth noting that a few years prior to this album, Simon Cowell got Hogan to do a cover of Gary Glitter's The Leader of the Gang with the band Green Jelly. Hogan only did the vocals for this project, but it actually hit number one in the UK in 1993. Considering how much I loved Hulk Hogan and Green Jelly, I'm shocked that I didn't learn about this until just now. Well, it's probably because this was a UK thing that didn't get distro in the US. Another interesting little artifact that I found while looking for proof of Hulk Hogan's bass playing is this video on YouTube from 2008. The video description refers to Kevin Nash as the big show. Like, damn, not old tall guys are the same. During Sturgis Bike Week, a band called Diamondback has Hulk Hogan jump on stage and join them on bass for a cover of Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good. And before you ask, nobody got their mouth farted in. When we watch the clip though, the Hulkster's playing is actually really tight. And the fact that he was just hanging out at a bar, having a few beers with the boys, and then all of a sudden he's like, yeah, I'll jump up and play bass for your cover song. Presumably unrehearsed, and he plays it flawlessly. It probably is 100% the truth that he was a session musician before. That being said though, I came across something even better while I was looking into this. A record he put out in Japan. It's not unheard of for American wrestlers to release albums in Japan. I mean, Hulk's in good company here with Abdullah the Butcher and Terry Funk. But the thing about Hulk's album, he actually does play bass on it. 
So in 1983, while Hulk is in New Japan Pro Wrestling, he releases an album called Hulk Hogan and Itch Band. Now, what kind of name is Itch Band? They got fleas or something? So in Japan, Hulk Hogan gets the nickname Ichiban, meaning number one. So presumably the band name is a play on that, albeit a somewhat unfortunate one. So listening to this album, which has four tracks, the vocals leave a little bit to be desired. But the bass playing on the album, in my opinion, is actually really good. You know, it's very funky, it's a bit more involved than the Hulk Rules stuff. It's You listen to it and it's, it sounds like music that was written by a bass player. Like, I'm not saying he's Victor Wooten or anything like that, but you listen to it and it's way better than you would expect Hulk Hogan to be on bass. And a lot more impressive than what we have of his American recordings. Which, I mean, kind of lines up with his wrestling career, too. Just look up Hulk Hogan vs. The Great Muda in Japan. You'll see the guy move like he didn't know he could move. He's out here chain wrestling, doing submission moves, whipping out enzigiris. So yeah, Hulk Hogan didn't actually almost join Metallica. But there's a lot more to his music career than you probably realized, and he's much more competent of a musician than you ever would have expected. I've had a lot of people asking me to make more wrestling related content on the channel, and you're in luck. Because I've also had a lot of wrestling lost media cases submitted to me the past few months. And for this episode of Your Lost Media, I have a lost Japanese WWE segment, a lost entrance theme, and artifacts of a long forgotten fan club. And remember, if you have a lost media story that you'd like me to look into, send it to wanglostmedia at gmail.com. This one was submitted to me by Jane Altoids on Twitter, the WCW Slam Society. In January of 2016, WrestleCrap.com, a website that's been around since 2000, talking about wrestling's most ridiculous and sometimes obscure moments, published an article entitled, Someone Bought This, WCW Slam Society Fan Club CD-ROM. Very little information about this CD-ROM actually existed online, so the article's author, Paul Kraft, went largely from memory. Crappers, this one is so obscure that I can't even find an image of it, so you'll have to settle for the horribly ugly WCW logo up there instead. In 1999, or it may have been early in 2000, WCW sent out a CD-ROM to people on their catalog or WCW magazine mailing lists. The CD-ROM was labeled WCW Slam Society. I guess it was meant to be a multimedia fan club of some kind. The CD-ROM featured an exclusive match between two mid-carters which took place in an empty studio, hey, just like the AWA Turkey Challenge, against a blue screen where they insert cartoony CGI stuff in an attempt to make a virtual world. I think it was meant to represent a steel mill or something industrial and tough like that. I wish I had footage or at least some screenshots of that to show you just how silly and strange it looked. It was a little like that scene in Who Framed Roger Rabbit where the humans interact with Roger and Baby Herman while filming a cartoon. The CD-ROM also had other multimedia, interview clips, promos for other WCW events, and so on. As far as I know, only two or three of these CD-ROMs were ever produced before the entire concept was abandoned. More info about the WCW Slam Society can be found in a post by WCW Worldwide, which is actually a great account to follow for obscure WCW content. Here, they dug up a print ad for the WCW Slam Society, and it actually seems to be a premium fan club of sorts. And like me, the person who runs this account also had zero recollection of it. But when you sign up for the WCW Slam Society, you get 12 monthly newsletters, members only t-shirt, Slam Society membership card, chances to meet WCW superstars, contests and sweepstakes, WCW Magazine discount certificate, discounts on WCW merchandise, access to members only website, email newsletters, an 8x10 signed glossy of a WCW superstar, testosterone sold separately. It's actually not a bad deal for $24.99 a month. If you were a hardcore WCW fan, it sounds like you'd be getting your money's worth. Especially, you know, if those testosterone injections don't cost that much extra. Despite having watched every second of wrestling I possibly could have during this time, I had no memory of the WCW Slam Society. And there is very little that can be found out about it online. You got a brief reference to it in an interview with Rey Mysterio. You have an archived website that reiterates the same info as the print ad, as well as a members-only website that's coming soon and as far as I could tell, never actually materialized. 
And as far as I can tell, it seems like it was only ever actually promoted on one episode of Monday Nitro. The April 12th, 1999 episode, and the segment promoting it has since been removed from the Peacock Network streaming service. Some of the membership content definitely did get released, as we can see that there's people on Twitter who posted their membership cards. And at some point, a WrestleCrap commenter even found the members only t-shirt on eBay, although the image is now broken. Incidentally, a WrestleCrap commenter found another disc. I got a CD and a 1999 edition of WCW Magazine. It had the matches in a weird industrial virtual world with tall spikes that surrounded the outside of the ring. I want to check it out, but the videos use a weird video program that I haven't been able to get around. Judging by his description, this disc, which he also included an image of WCW Cybering, probably used that same CGI content from the Slam Society. That being said, the Slam Society discs, I imagine, probably also used the same weird video program. So who knows if we'll ever get to see their contents again. The next one comes from Mark Heal. In Mark's email, he mentions that during his time as the admin of a Facebook wrestling group, he'd seen a lot of obscure images. But there is one in particular that he'd never been able to identify, and it actually becomes somewhat of a meme in the group. The image depicts a blonde, long-haired wrestler from behind browsing a selection of manga in Japan. Nobody could ever figure out what this was actually from, and it's bothered him ever since. The closest match to this image was a video from WWE 24-7, a shorty entitled Japan is Jericho. In the video, Chris Jericho visits a bunch of different locations like museums and stores during a WWE tour of Japan. Although Chris Jericho fits the look of the guy in this image, you never actually see this happen in the video. Another detail worth noting is that throughout the video, Chris Jericho wears a wool pea coat, whereas the person in the image is wearing a leather jacket, meaning that if it's from the same trip, it's most likely a different wrestler. And judging by his appearance, I have to agree that the guy in the screenshot is almost certainly Christian. And the WWE logo in the bottom corner tells me that this is most likely something that did air at some point. If I had guessed, most likely a similar WWE 24-7 shorty segment. But as of now, none of this content is available on the Peacock Network or any official WWE source. What's been preserved of WWE 24-7 content is mostly just what people happen to save throughout the years. And no such video of Christian in Japan has surfaced. Perhaps there's someone watching this video who for some reason cataloged all the WWE 24-7 content throughout the years. Otherwise, perhaps this one has just lost the time or up to whenever WWE sees the need to re-upload it. This one was sent to me by Kill Name em Saint, a rare Fit Finley theme song from 2008. So starting in 2006, Fit Finley had himself a little sidekick, Hornswoggle, formerly Little Bastard, a leprechaun who would help Fit Finley win matches. The pair separated when it's revealed that Hornswoggle is in fact Vince McMahon's illegitimate son, leaving them to go off on their own storylines for a period of time. During this period of time, Fit Finley is coming out to his theme song Lambeg. It's this intense, marchy kind of song with traditional Irish instrumentation. You know, because he's Irish and he loves to fight. Meanwhile, Hornswoggle has his own theme song, more an upbeat theme song. Can't play it because, you know, WWE will claim it, but, you know, picture the kind of song that you think a leprechaun might have, and you're probably right. Eventually, Hornswoggle is put in a match against the Great Khali, during which Finley comes to Hornswoggle's rescue. On the February 25th, 2008 episode of Raw, JBL claims that Hornswoggle is in fact not Vince McMahon's son, but Fit Finley's. The following week, Fit Finley comes out to address these allegations, and that's when something interesting happens. When he comes out during this episode, a different theme song plays. This is an Irish-sounding punk song along the lines of something you might expect from the Dropkick Murphys or someone like that. Listen. Finley confirms that Hornswoggle is in fact his son, and at WrestleMania 24, he comes out to fight JBL using his old theme again, 
and then that theme is cut off by Hornswoggle's theme when he comes out to join him. And thus, Fit Finley's brand new punk rock theme song is never heard again. Literally used on just one episode of Raw, and that's that. In the Boston Herald, it was revealed that the song was created by a local Boston folk punk band, the Swagger and Growlers, who were contacted by the WWE on MySpace and commissioned to make the song specifically for Fit Finley, under the guidance of WWE's longtime in house music producer Jim Johnston. The article goes on to talk about how excited they are for the upcoming recurring national TV exposure, which clearly it didn't pan out that way. But the song does have a bit of a legend around it. Based on the 48 or so seconds that we heard of it, people thought it was a pretty cool sounding song. And it was just such a strange thing for this brand new theme song to debut and immediately vanish during one of Fit Finley's highest profile storylines ever. Perhaps the plans they had for him changed, which does happen a lot in WWE. Or maybe they just decided after playing it that one time that it just wasn't a good fit for him. In any case, this complete song has never been released in any official capacity. The highest quality version that does exist is a cover of the song by a YouTuber named Heartbreak Kid Dimitri. And interestingly, one of the members of the Swagger and Growlers commented, Hey guys, I am actually was the one with my old band the Swagger and Growlers who arranged this for the WWE in 2008. They used it one time as a face entrance theme. The WWE fully owns the copyright, and they are not known to be kind in that regard. So, you may not want to have this posted. An interesting side note, he also commented that the song was completed within 48 hours of the WWE contacting them. In any case, it seems like we're unlikely to actually hear the official full version of the song unless the WWE decides to release it one day. It seems unlikely that they just put out a rare Fit Finley entrance theme for no apparent reason, but maybe one day they'll put out a collection of rarities and deep cuts or something that'll include it. But anyway, that's all for now, and note that while I was working on this video, I actually had another story that I was planning on including, but the more I looked into it, the more I thought that it merited its own video. So if you'd like to see that, be sure to subscribe so you can see it when it comes out. William Regal, Jim Ross, Shawn Michaels, Shane McMahon, McFoley, Hornswoggle, six men who are members of one of WWE's most elite organizations, a very exclusive club, that club of course being Vince McMahon's Kiss My Ass Club, a club in which members were forced to either kiss Vince McMahon's ass or face the consequences. In all of wrestling history, perhaps with the exception of Rikishi, there's perhaps no ass more legendary than Vince McMahon's. So much so that it even received its own cartoon, a short-lived series entitled Mr. McMahon's Kiss My Ass Club, the WWE's Most Valuable Asset. This cartoon, which is now mostly lost, was the cause of the greatest lawsuit that the WWE has ever been involved in. So for today's episode of Tales from the Internet, let's take a look at the cartoon about Vince McMahon's ass. When I was a kid, I had these VHS tapes recorded off of TV of the old WWF cartoon, Hulk Hogan's Rockin' Wrestling. I watched these tapes so much that I basically rendered them unusable. But I still constantly think back to that episode where they confuse Andre the Giant with a gorilla, so he goes to jail. Or the episode where Tainted Chili turns all the wrestlers into little kids. As goofy as wrestling can get, you can always push it a little bit further in animation. A tradition that's continued this day with Camp WWE and WWE's crossovers with Scooby-Doo and the Jetsons. But I only recently learned of an incredibly obscure, very short-lived WWE cartoon that completely dwarfs these in terms of the absolute absurdity. And the plot's basically this. Vince McMahon's ass, which for some reason has its own muscular arms, meaning that Vince McMahon is some kind of Goro-like creature in this world. The ass takes on a life of its own and gets into all kinds of wacky shenanigans. And when I talk about this thing having existed, it almost sounds like something some dude on 4chan made up one day and everyone's like, oh yeah, yeah, let's go find the ass cartoon. But no, this is verifiably a 100% real thing that was actually made. So at the time, Michael Cole was in charge of WWE.com. WWE.com covered all kinds of stuff from the shows, but also had a little bit of original content. Lots of goofy, non-canonical exclusives that, you know, would have a lot more creative liberties in the stuff that would actually play on TV. 
So one day, Michael Cole asks one of his staffers if they can come up with a creative idea that Vince McMahon would like. And if you know about Vince McMahon's tastes and his sense of humor, there's perhaps nothing that could be more tailor-made to this man than a cartoon about his own ass. And reportedly, he was completely enamored with this idea. So it debuts in November of 2006 with a holiday episode entitled Thanksgiving Acerol. As it was also included in the Survivor Series 2006 DVD, this is the only episode of the series that has actually been preserved. It begins with a song about Vince McMahon's ass that features audio samples of Vince McMahon talking about his ass as a cartoon Vince does his iconic Vince McMahon walk out to the ring. But his pants are pulled down and his ass is hanging out. And also, you look at the Titantron and his ass is lifting weights and it's riding a motorcycle, his ass is playing the drums. The plot of the episode is that Vince and some of the other wrestlers are celebrating Thanksgiving in the middle of the ring. But you got a problem. You see, the caterer made them vegan food, including a tofu turkey. Clearly, Vince McMahon had to make this caterer pay for his insolence. So, the caterer is forced to kiss Vince McMahon's ass, which is wearing a pilgrim hat because it's Thanksgiving. Vince then farts the caterer off his ass, then pulls a real turkey dinner out of his ass, which everyone eats, thereby saving Thanksgiving. The cartoon is a minute and a half long fever dream, but frankly, it's perfect for what it is. I could not endure a half hour version of this show, but I could definitely sit down and watch 30 of these. And supposedly, there are a lot more of them, but you can't see them and here's the reason why. On January 1st of 2007, it starts to be widely reported that the creators of the series, Assy McGee, were suing WWE over the cartoon. Assy McGee, for the uninitiated, was an adult swim show about a violent, alcoholic police detective who is a walking, talking ass. In the reports, they're saying that Michael Cole is in big trouble over this. And it's noted that a few of the storylines for the Vince McMahon ass cartoon were directly taken from Assy McGee. Now, since the reporting says that a few of the storylines were taken, that means that there are several episodes of this show. And reports also said that Michael Cole had hired an animator to produce this show full time as well as make t-shirts. The narrative that this cartoon is lost because of the lawsuit is basically what pops up whenever you look for the show. Yet it doesn't make entirely too much sense to me. For starters, Assy McGee debuted on November 26th of 2006, but Vince McMahon's ass was being promoted as early as November 10th of 2006. Furthermore, the characters are completely different. Assy McGee is an entirely autonomous ass with a life of his own, whereas Vince McMahon's ass is still very much a part of Vince McMahon. And on top of that, Assy McGee is a crime mystery show where I don't really see how those storylines would fit into the Vince McMahon's ass show. And I couldn't find any actual details about the lawsuit itself, other than, you know, reports at a bunch of different wrestling news sites saying that it totally did happen. And one forum post pointing to a statement from WWE claimed that the lawsuit reports were fake, although I couldn't seem to turn up that statement. Frankly though, a lot of backstage wrestling reporting is kinda sketchy and a lot of times they get things wrong. Sometimes one guy will just say a thing that all the other wrestling websites will repeat it, maybe they'll embellish it a little bit, you know, so it's not a stolen story, it's original reporting. So it's very possible that the lawsuit, the supposed heat on Michael Cole, and for that matter the full-time animator and the several storylines weren't entirely accurate. That being said though, the evidence does seem to point to the existence of at least one other episode of this show. A Redditor named ListenUpSlapNuts20, who had become very invested in finding the lost episodes of Vince McMahon's ass, sent me an email with his findings. In a post he made to r slash squared circle looking for any information about the cartoon, a user named Scott Fried recalled a second episode in which Vince McMahon makes Mel Gibson kiss his ass. And after searching for more, Slabnuts found people in the past also looking for the cartoon, and another user, Damien001, recalls in addition to the Thanksgiving episode, there is another episode called Passion of the Ass. Which, you know, putting together the recollection of the Mel Gibson episode with the title Passion of the Ass, it seems pretty obvious that there is some kind of parody of Passion of the Christ going on here. Going back even further to 2010, Slapmouse discovered a forum post about Mr. McMahon and his ass, which included two YouTube videos, which are unfortunately deleted and not archived, but we've got episode two labeled Passion of the Ass, with the remark at the bottom, at least Mel Gibson's ass has been kissed in cartoon, so it counts. So we've got three independent accounts spread across time claiming that there was a Mel Gibson episode of this show. So at this point, I'm pretty confident that the thing actually exists, but you know, I'm searching for it, nothing's really turning up. And then I find the thing that to me is undeniable proof. 
Google wasn't turning up much, but then I went on DuckDuckGo, and it brought me to a website of an animation studio called Animax. And in one of their posts, they made a synopsis of a cartoon that they made for WWE, The Passion of the Ass Starring Mel Gibson. Tonight, the latest cartoon that Animax Entertainment produced for WWE went live. It's called Mel Gibson's Passion of the Ass, and it features Vince McMahon taking the Apocalypto director to task for being a drunk, a racist, and an all-around ass. Mel Gibson might have been number one at the box office this past weekend, but Mr. McMahon's ass is tops. Clicking on the link to the cartoon, of course, takes you a page on WWE's website that is no longer active. Although when you put it into the internet archive, you can see that The Passion of the Ass was published on WWE.com on December 13th of 2006. And an archive of Animax's post also shows a still from the episode. So I'm looking through Animax's posts a little bit more and I find another post about a teaser for the cartoon, which also can't be viewed right now. But if they made a whole teaser, I'm thinking there's got to be more than two episodes of this. And then I find a post from Animax about the lawsuit that clears everything up. In their post, which likens wrestling news sites to the Weekly World News, they inform their readers that there actually was in fact a lawsuit happening. But they found it ridiculous for a lot of the reasons that I outlined earlier in the video. The show launched before Assy McGee did, and aside from them being two asses, the concepts of the shows are completely different. As they put it, while they are both asses, they are as different as Mickey Mouse and Mighty Mouse. But for the purpose of this video, the most important part of the post they made is this. They state that only two of the episodes have ever been released, but others are in the can. So there you have it from the creators of the cartoon themselves. The passion of the ass is out there. It doesn't seem to be floating around online, but someone has to have saved this thing. And as for the other episodes, they were made. It's just they've never actually been released. Frankly, I think it's super unlikely a WWE ever chooses to release these cartoons, but you never know. Maybe that's the kind of thing that maybe one day someone with access to it just leak it. Fingers crossed, but I won't hold my breath. So let's start off with the solved case. The Lost Episode of Vince McMahon's Ass Cartoon The Lost Episode, Passion of the Ass, was uploaded to the Internet Archive by Ducky23191 and shared on my subreddit r slash wang by HorselessHH. It's a 1 minute and 40 second cartoon in which a drunken Mel Gibson is forced to kiss Vince McMahon's ass. That said, this isn't the end to the mystery. If you watch the video, you'll recall that there were several episodes that were finished and never released. And to that point, I was provided with the contact information for a person involved in the production of these cartoons. As of the recording of this video, they have not responded to my email, and I doubt they can legally share all that much about it. At the very least though, I'm hoping they can share the plots of the episodes with me. Anyway, now it's Batman time. When I was a little kid, there was perhaps no wrestler that I hated more than Ravishing Rick Rude. All gyrating his hips with his goofy curly mullet, his sissy painted pants. Disgusting. And then he's feuding a lot with the Ultimate Warrior, who at the time is my absolute favorite. So, you know, screw that guy. But, you know, you get older and as a wrestling fan, you start to realize that you hate guys like Rick Rude for the reasons that they want you to hate them. And you start to develop an appreciation for their craft. Respecting that a performer like Rick Rude can have the crowd eating out of the palm of his hands. That the Rude Awakening was a brutal finisher for its time, and just that in general he could put on a great entertaining match. But then a freak accident in a match with Sting cuts his career short, only to years later show up one night in ECW and start a whole new phase of his career. He's not wrestling, but he's there and he's making sure his presence is felt. And all these kids who grew up hating Rick Rude, all of a sudden they're grown up and now they're fully aboard the Rick Rude train. This reinvention eventually leads him to being the only person to ever appear on both WWF Raw and WCW Nitro at the same night at the same time. And another tidbit that I often see left out of this trivia, he also made an appearance on ECW Hardcore TV that weekend. So he was a force in every big wrestling promotion all at once. Meanwhile, there's reports of him training for an actual return to in-ring action. So this guy, who's often counted among the very best wrestlers to never have the world championship, he's getting ready to finally take his place at the top. And then suddenly, in 1999, seemingly out of nowhere, he passes away at just 40 years old from heart failure. Now, if you're a fan of wrestling, you know that young, tragic deaths aren't a rare occurrence. Especially with guys of Rick Rude's generation. But this death in particular 
is haunted by a bizarre urban legend. An urban legend that's largely been pushed by some of his former colleagues. The rumor that he had taken his own life after he had to undergo a penile amputation. So for this video, let's take a look at what really happened to Rick Rude. When it comes to wrestling trivia and stories and myths, I like to think that I'm a pretty knowledgeable guy. But somehow, this urban legend had just completely flown under my radar. In fact, as it turns out, I had completely misremembered the nature of Rick Rude's death. I had thought that he had died of testicular cancer. Because you see, it was widely reported in 1998 that he had testicular cancer. But in truth, it turned out that he had a spermatocele which is a relatively common type of benign cyst that's often mistaken for testicular cancer at first. In fact, Rick Rude had died in April of 1999 due to heart failure, likely related to an overdose of the medications he was taking. Although it's generally accepted that this overdose was accidental, there are those who think that it was on purpose. And that's where this urban legend stems from. If he did it, why did he do it? What led me down this rabbit hole, of all things, was Gunther's Intercontinental Championship reign. On September 8th of 2023, Gunther became the longest reigning WWE Intercontinental Champion of all time, surpassing the Honky Tonk Man's record. Which of course leads to a lot of people online talking about Honky Tonk Man. Me personally? Not a fan. You know how at the beginning of the video I said that Rick Rude was the kind of guy that would make you hate him for the reasons he wanted you to hate him? I found Honky Tonk Man to be quite the opposite. And I know a lot of people disagree with this take, but to me with the Honky Tonk Man, it wasn't that, you know, he would piss me off and I want to see him get beat. It was that I thought he was boring and I didn't want to watch him. Honky Tonk Man comes on and I want to change the channel or fast forward the tape. It's like that one sign that a fan brought to a show a few years back. Sir. I feel compelled to stress that we are not booing because of your effective heel work, we are booing because you are simply awful. But while Honky Tonk Man isn't everyone's cup of tea in the ring, there's a lot of people who find him distasteful for reasons outside of the ring. For example, his attempts to get Jake the Snake Roberts to start drinking again after he finally overcame decades of alcoholism and drug abuse. Or when he made fun of Bret Hart's stroke on kayfabe commentaries. Who would you rather work with? Who would you rather have matches with for the next 5, 10, or 15 years of your fucking career? Me? Or Goldberg, who kicked you in the fucking head and gave you a goddamn stroke and now you drag your foot around you can't even get your dick hard? my <laughs> So, you know, then you got a bunch of people sharing their favorite Honky Tonk Man is a piece of shit moment. But amidst all of this, I see something that I had never seen before. A quick backstage interview with the Honky Tonk Man taken in 2015 by Hannibal TV. In the clip, he comments on Rick Rude's death. He injected Viagra in his dick because he thought he could get an instant hard on. And he could fuck a lot of broads, but instead he got an infection and his nuts swelled up the size of cantaloupes, so they had to cut everything away from him. And then he went home and killed himself. What a way to go. Now at this point, even if you have no prior familiarity with the Honky Tonk Man, you have no idea about his reputation, maybe you're not even a wrestling fan at all, you're probably just like, yeah, sure buddy. You know, he just doesn't have the kind of credibility to be taken seriously when making such an outlandish claim. But the thing is, he's not the only one that's made this claim. Hannibal has another interview with the wrestler Ken Patera. I feel like a lot of you guys might not remember Ken Patera, but the image of him getting whipped over and over again by the Heenan family just burned into my memory. And in the interview, Ken Patera agrees with Honky Tonk Man's story, saying that he had heard it from Jim Neidhart. I heard about it two days after they found him dead on the floor. I heard from, about it from Jim Neidhart, because Jim Neidhart and Rick Rube were real close friends. And I think at that time, Neidhart was living down there in Florida. I, I think they lived real close together. And uh, he said, uh, Rick just lost his fucking mind because they had he had to go to the hospital and they're gonna amputate his penis. Well, his penis was the most dearest thing to him. To my knowledge, that's a true story. Unfortunately, Jim Neidhart is no longer with us to be able to comment on this story, but Hannibal continued to pull on this thread in another interview with John Nord, who you might remember as the Berserker. 
Not to mention his rant about pancakes, which may be one of my favorite wrestling promos of all time. They eat a lot of pancakes! So in the interview, Hannibal asked John Nord about Rick Rude, and here's what he had to say. Uh, I want to say back then, like right after it happened, I think it was Kurt. And we all talked about it, and then that's what we had heard that exactly that, you know, he was sh shooting up to, you know, I mean, Rick had that, I guess you call it demon of, of you know, he just wanted to get kinky as hell and get numb, and, and, and then he would, you know, actually shoot it in his pecker. In the interview, John mentions that he had heard the story from Kurt Hennig, aka Mr. Perfect. But like Jim Neidhart, Kurt Hennig is also unfortunately not with us anymore. However, shortly after Rick Rude's death, Kurt Hennig had actually published a letter about him. And in part of the letter, he addresses some of the rumors about his death. I don't want anyone to lump him in with those stories about wrestlers abusing drugs and steroids. Rick Rude was not on anything heavy duty. He may have been taking some pain pills for his ribs. I've heard some people say his death was a suicide. No way. He was too much of a man to do that. If he had a problem, he would face it. He would look death in the eye. He wouldn't coward out of anything he did in his whole life. He was the most stand-up guy I ever knew. I learned so much from him about being a man. He was a man's man, 100%. So clearly, from what Kurt writes here, he's not 100% sure whether or not the death was accidental. But clearly, he thinks it's very unlikely that it was on purpose, so I highly doubt he was just going around spreading this rumor about him. So then, essentially, that just leaves us with this game of telephone where two of the supposed originators are dead. And one of these dead men left behind public statements that contradict the story. Something that did raise my eyebrow with this, though. It's kind of strange that you only seem to start hearing about the story 15 years after Rick Rude died. But as it turns out, a user of the Wrestling Figs forums, NYStyle4683, did manage to find a mention of it that was posted mere months after Rick Rude's death. In a Google Groups thread about Rick Rude's death, a user named Jet Green says, How come the article doesn't mention anything about his pecker falling off due to gangrene? After he shot so much Viagra into it to get a hard on after losing his balls to testicular cancer. Woo! Can't believe I got all that in one sentence. We want the real facts, not some cover-up. Now, as I said before, it turned out that the testicular cancer scare just turned out to be a benign cyst. But as you can see here, the amputation rumor had been going around as far back as 1999. And reading this post, I can't help but think that this urban legend exists because of the cancer scare. In fact, thinking back, I don't think the story that it turned out to not be testicular cancer ever really got a lot of traction. As I remember it, and granted this is going back a really long time now, the way I remember it was, it was reported that he had testicular cancer and you didn't really see him anymore, and then it was later reported that he died. Which of course is going to lead to a lot of people trying to fill in the blanks. And you also do have insiders who explicitly deny these rumors. For example, there's Bruce Pritchard. In his podcast, Something to Wrestle, his co-host Conrad Thompson asks him about this rumor. Here's what Bruce had to say. I think it all sounds extremely silly to me. And from what I know of Rick Rude, he was not the type of guy that would even consider... Have you ever heard any, anything as silly as guys injecting Viagra into their penis? No. Had you ever heard this before? No. This is all brand new information to you? Yes. So you're going to chalk this up as bullshit rumor and innuendo? A lot of rumor and innuendo. Okay. Something else you have to consider about this story. Is this even possible? I asked one of my friends, an actual doctor who you're probably familiar with, Chubby Emu. These were his quick thoughts on the matter. That's an interesting case. I suppose injecting directly there could have some benefit compared to taking a tablet, but the risk of side effects could be way more. For the infection, it depends. If it was like an abscess, think giant zit on the shaft, it would have needed to have stopped blood supply flowing there for some time, causing parts of it to die for the tissue to need to be amputated. So we're not talking like an instant cell death but rather it would have had to have been something that was allowed to sit there for some time untreated. Which, I mean, considering if this were true, how embarrassing of a situation it would be to explain to a doctor, I could see a person doing that. But it would take a lot of damage for absolutely everything to need to be removed. And the pain would probably be unimaginable before you got to that point. 
And then you have to remember, Viagra only came out in 1998. So then you're working with this very small time frame there where he would have had to come to the conclusion that taking it orally is no good. So you know what, I'm just gonna skip a million steps and in inject it directly to an area where a normal person spends most of their life trying to avoid any sort of pain or any sort of damage. I mean, granted, for anything that you can think of where the question is, why would someone do this? There's probably someone that's done it. You know, like one out of a million guys will do that. But to me, this just doesn't pass the smell test. Furthermore, if you made a movie and Rick Rude was a fictional character in your movie, and this was the ending for him, I would say, come on, that's a little too on the nose. Get a little more creative. Because for a wrestler like Rick Rude, his sexual prowess was just so intrinsic to the character. You know, he's this womanizing ladies man, the women can't get enough of him. And he's more than happy to run through all the best ones. And on top of that, in his actual matches, he would play that up where his crotch was kind of this vulnerable point. To illustrate it for you perfectly, understand that there is an entire Twitter account dedicated to Rick Rude's over-the-top selling of Atomic Drops. So you've got this person whose entire life basically revolves around his dick, and he dies of losing his dick. It sounds like something that people would be inclined to make up and believe just because it puts a neat little bow on everything, but personally, to me, that just sounds like bullshit. On April 5th of 1992, at the climax of WrestleMania 8, it all came crashing down for the Hulkster. A beatdown by Psycho Sid and Papa Shango. But at the last moment, an old friend and rival came to save the day. The Ultimate Warrior. But there was one problem. According to a lot of people, this was not the original Ultimate Warrior. Nowadays, it's really hard for WWE or any other wrestling company to surprise their fans. It seems like the very second any big signings happen or there's any kind of backstage news, the dirt sheets are already reporting on it. If you're a wrestling fan and you want to avoid having things spoiled for you, it can be really hard to avoid them and you have to be really conscious about the sites you browse. But things were very different in the 80s and 90s. People in the wrestling industry at that point were just a lot more protective of any kind of behind the scenes information. But people still had the same desire to know the truth of what's going on behind the scenes and what's going to happen and because of that all kinds of crazy rumors and misinformation would pop up. And today I'm going to talk about one of my favorite of one of these rumors, the old story that they were actually two Ultimate Warriors. The two Ultimate Warriors story was a rumor that was repeated so much throughout the 90s that a lot of people thought it was true. In fact, there are probably a lot of people watching this who did think it was actually the real thing that happened. To everyone else, that sounds completely ridiculous, so how could such an idea spread around all over the world? It's like that S thing that for some reason everybody knew how to draw. One of the biggest contributing factors to this is the confusion around the Ultimate Warrior's disappearance in 1991 and his subsequent return in 1992. You have to figure, the Ultimate Warrior was a top star, very over with the fans, and basically groomed to be the successor to Hulk Hogan. Yet after the main event of SummerSlam 1991, he just simply vanished with absolutely no explanation. Of course it was really confusing for fans that a guy would go from suddenly being the main event of one of the flagship events of the year to suddenly not even at house shows or anything, just gone. The fans could tell that this was not a normal thing, but without the backstage reporting that we have today, they had no idea why. And a lot of people thought he just died. And there's a lot of ideas about what caused him to die, most of them regarding steroid usage. The original Ultimate Warrior died of liver failure due to his steroid usage. Rather than killing off the UW character like he should have, Vince McMahon chose to bring in a bad East Coast actor to play the new and improved Ultimate Warrior. What this guy will do to retain his millions, angry face. Another theory was that his muscles literally exploded. Is the Ultimate Warrior muscle explode myth true? When I was in college, my buddy said that Ultimate Warrior lift Yokozuna and his muscle burst? I guess this is far-fetched, what can you say? The rumor that stuck with me as a then 7 year old was that he wrestled Earthquake and when he attempted to do his Gorilla Press Slam, a muscle exploded in his arm, hence why he disappeared. And I'm sure like me right now, you're picturing his muscles literally bursting like a cartoon character or something, but I was actually surprised 
to find out that this is kind of something that can happen. There's a condition called rhabdomyolysis in which injured muscular tissue can break down and cause a dangerous amount of myoglobin to get into your system. This is extremely rare, but if it were to happen, it could cause kidney failure. Of course, the people spreading this rumor weren't thinking of that, though. They were thinking about his muscles bursting and he's flying away like a balloon or something. And then there was the other one that his armbands were so tight that it cut off his blood circulation and he died from that. And then there were some other slightly more reasonable proponents of the two Ultimate Warriors theory who thought, well, maybe he just quit and WWF owned the characters, so they just got a new guy to do it. It's a concept that isn't really that far-fetched, considering that we would see it play out later with the fake Diesel and Razor Ramon. So when the Ultimate Warrior did make his return in 1992, there were a lot of people who were convinced that he looked completely different. The biggest change that a lot of people cited was that although he was still really big, he wasn't as big as he used to be. And there were a few people that said that the new Ultimate Warrior had tiny baby feet. I'm not entirely convinced by the baby feet theory. But hypothetically speaking, say that there were two Ultimate Warriors, who was the new one then? There actually were a few theories about this. One of the main candidates for being the second Ultimate Warrior was Jim Powers. Jim Powers was a wrestler whose top career highlight was probably being the first guy to lose to Ric Flair in the WWF. He spent most of his time with the company in and out of the tag team division and as an enhancement talent, aka a jobber. But he was definitely a big dude, and according to some people, he did have the look to play the Ultimate Warrior if they wanted him to do that. The only real problem being that he was a lot shorter than the Ultimate Warrior, and also he probably would have had to do a, a little bit of tweaking to his promo style. They're relatively new, we haven't seen too, mu too much uh, wrestling films on them. Ah, you can feel it too! There was another more plausible candidate to be the second Ultimate Warrior, and it's the guy that most people who believed in the theory thought was doing it. That guy would be the Texas Tornado, Kerry Von Erich. There were a lot of factors going into why people thought Kerry Von Erich was the new Ultimate Warrior, the most of which being that they did have a really similar look. If we look at this picture of Kerry Von Erich, he basically has an identical physique to the Warrior. They're also the exact same height, they had a very similar haircut, I mean the face is a little different you might say, but you know you throw some face paint on there and a lot of people will be fooled, especially small children. If the WWE were to cast a new Ultimate Warrior in 1992, Kerry Von Erich would be an absolute no-brainer to play the part. And another factor that contributes to the Kerry Von Erich as the Ultimate Warrior theory is that he also disappeared mysteriously around the the same time. His last appearance before the Ultimate Warrior returned was at the January 1992 Royal Rumble where he was eliminated by, who else? Ric Flair. <gasps> he would not reappear again until slightly after WrestleMania, and even then only as a curtain jerker on superstars and house shows. So it would be very easy for someone to have missed those appearances and just assumed he was working as the Ultimate Warrior now. Another factor that would reinforce this rumor was that in 1993, Jim Helwig, the man behind the Ultimate Warrior, would have his name legally changed to Warrior. And due to the nature of how information would spread in those days, it was like playing a game of telephone where eventually that news turned into, you had one Ultimate Warrior who was Jim Helwig, and then you had the other Ultimate Warrior that was just Warrior. And then, did you ever have a friend tell you that they saw the Ultimate Warrior on WCW? I'm talking about seeing him before, you know, Hulk Hogan imagined seeing him in the mirror and all that business. Well, if they told you that, they had probably seen this guy called Renegade. At the time, WCW had recently signed Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage, and they were really going for getting all the old WWF classics. Hulk Hogan started promoting something called the Ultimate Surprise, and they were showing the silhouette of a man who, if you didn't know better, would say he was definitely the Ultimate Warrior. But unfortunately for WCW, they couldn't secure a deal with the Ultimate Warrior, so instead, they just got this dude called the Renegade. They found some guy who vaguely resembled him, threw on some face paint, had to mimic some of the gestures, and here we go, we got our ultimate surprise. Nothing really matched up, but I guess there were enough people who believed it, because at some point Jim Helwig, uh, Ultimate Warrior, did debunk the fact that he in fact wasn't this guy. No, this was not the genuine Ultimate Warrior, this was a male stripper they hired named Richard Wilson. And even though this ploy by WCW did manage to fool a handful of naive kids, I think 
Perhaps it's the best proof at all that there really is only one Ultimate Warrior. A fact that we'd all be reminded of back in 2014 when the Ultimate Warrior made his triumphant return back to WWE, gave an unforgettable speech that almost sounded like his own eulogy a day before passing away. There really is no doubt that the two Ultimate Warriors theory is complete nonsense, but even still, what happened in 1991 then? It's still obviously not normal that one of their top stars would just mysteriously vanish out of nowhere. Well, there's actually a series of correspondences between Vince McMahon and the Ultimate Warrior that was released a few years ago that tells us what happened. Essentially, the whole thing boils down to a dispute over pay. In a handwritten letter to Vince, Warrior airs his grievances. I want $550,000 released from the monies allotted to me to purchase my home. This will suffice as my WrestleMania 7 payoff, but let it be noted that it is not fair. I meant as much or more to that show as Hulk. I deserve to be paid the same. I know what Hulk will get. Four days off every other time period except pay-per-view only. I want the same pay cut as Hulk gets on all pay-per-views, Saturday night main events, Friday primetime, house shows, and proof as such. The same pay cut applies to what Hulk has been paid with relationship to past events, WrestleMania 5, 6, 7, i.e. when Hulk was the top draw. I want numbers and proof of monies done on 1900 Hulk, and likewise, same pay cut. Same pay cut on all forms of merchandising. And with the main event to SummerSlam 1991 on the line, Vince McMahon decided to comply with his demands. Dear Jim, this letter is in response to your facsimile to me of July 10th, 1991. You will be paid an aggregate amount of $550,000 for your participation in WrestleMania 7. With the exception of special events only, you will receive four days off every other time off period. Your pay rate on house shows will increase to 4-5% of the net, effective immediately with the understanding that no other WWF athlete will be paid at a higher rate. Likewise, no other WWF athlete will be paid at a higher pay rate than you on pay-per-view events. Effective immediately, your royalty rate on all forms of merchandise is to be increased. The specific amount will be determined in writing within one week. Your compensation for the Warrior 900 hotline will be identical to that of the Hulk 900 hotline. Likewise, documentation for this will follow in writing within one week. I regret the turmoil you've put yourself through and you're agonizing over what you feel is fair compensation. And even though we have a difference of opinion over some of these matters, I am resolved to work with you in the same honest and equitable way that I always have. Furthermore, I would like to express to you my deepest appreciation and admiration for you as a performer, as a member of the WWF family, as a man, and as my friend, Vince. But then once SummerSlam 1991 had passed, Vince McMahon immediately suspended the Ultimate Warrior and told him why. You have become a legend in your own mind. You are certainly entitled to your opinion. However, you are not entitled to vent your feelings by breaching and threatening to breach your contract. In particular, you have breached the contract by failing to appear at matches in which you were scheduled to wrestle without a legitimate excuse, including matches which were scheduled to be televised, failing to cooperate with our booking department, and being rude and abusive to WWF fans. You also threatened that, unless I met your demands, that you were going to stay at home, not appearing at the numerous events which Titan has booked for you as far out as April 1992 on WrestleMania 8, unless and until you were giving all of the perks and pay of Hulk Hogan. Of course, you did not make your threat until Titan had spent tens of thousands of dollars to promote these events and your presence at them. Therefore, when on July 9th, 1991, you threatened to stay at home, thereby not even appearing at Titan's major summer pay-per-view event, SummerSlam, I had no choice but to accede to your exorbitant demands. Paragraph 9.6 of your contract provides that you shall use your best efforts in the ring in the performance of wrestling services for match or other activity. Titan's available remedies for your breach of these obligations are severe but fair. You forfeit any future payments of royalties and you are prohibited from using or exploiting the persona and characterization of Ultimate Warrior or Warrior or any substantially similar likeness or name thereof. Note that in all likelihood, Jim Helwig changing his name to Warrior was because of this stipulation. However, rather than suspend you for the duration of the contract term, September 23rd, 1992, a remedy which Titan has under paragraph 12 of the contract, I am temporarily suspending you from bookings. So there you have it. A dispute about money was ultimately what led to one of wrestling's longest, most persistent, most ridiculous urban legends. 
Did you know that there's a video game where the nature boy, Ric Flair, <gasps> did you know that there's a game where he fucks with you by murdering your friends and family? Neither did I. <laughs> So a few weeks ago I did a video on Wrestlemania the arcade game which I thought had some of the most surprisingly fucked up endings that a wrestling video game would ever have. I mean you get Shawn Michaels gets molested, Bam Bam Bigelow sets the audience on fire, uh, Razor Ramon gets beaten half to death and robbed. But those endings are nothing compared to the ending I'm about to tell you about. And before I get into it, I want to give a shout out to my friend Gregory who told me about this. Uh, go follow him on Twitter, go watch him kick ass as a wrestler. Just look at the fucking bridge on that tiger suplex, man. Jesus Christ. So if you're a fan of wrestling games, chances are you're pretty familiar with the Fire Pro series. It just has one of the best systems of all time. It's a timing-based grappling system, and it has a massive roster made of real wrestlers from around the world, and they get away with it legally by giving them fake names, like, uh... Stone Cold Steve Austin is the Bionic Man Steve Majors, Hulk Hogan is Axe Duggan, and Ric Flair gets called Dick Slender. And in Super Fire Pro Wrestling Special, Dick Slender does some fucked up shit. This game was written by a guy named Goichi Suda, who's better known as Suda51, and you might know him from games like Killer7 and No More Heroes, but back when this game was being made, he was still kind of just making a name for himself. This was his second game in, after switching careers from working at a funeral parlor, people say that he was a grave digger, and he digs some fucking graves in this game, man. In this installment of the Fire Pro game, your wrestling career has kind of a tragic start. Your coach dies mysteriously, and you wind up killing your friend in the ring accidentally. But still, like, it's always been your dream to be the world champion, so you just, you put in all that work, you beat everybody, and you slowly, slowly make your way all the way to the top until it's time to fight the world champion, Dick Slender, aka Ric Flair. <laughs> now, if you know Ric Flair, you know that he's the dirtiest player in the game, so he's not about to just let you waltz right in and take his belt from him, so what does he do? He murders your tag team partner in the middle of the ring, <laughs> and then he tells you that he's the one who killed your coach. <laughs> What? This is this is as bad of a bad guy as Ric Flair has been. This is a little further than he tends to go. As if all that isn't enough, though. While dealing with your dead friends, you know, your dead coach, Ric Flair's he's coming. He's out for blood. He's out for blood. What happens? Your girlfriend leaves you. It's some real high drama for a wrestling game, man. But you know what? With all that going on, it's still a video game, and you gotta win. You just gotta play it through the end, beat the boss, Ric Flair, and you win, and you do it. You beat Ric Flair, you beat Dick Slender, and you become the world champion. You stand up on the turnbuckle, raising your belt up high for all the fans, the fans love you, you're the fucking man. You're the fucking man, but yet, with everyone you've ever known, everyone that's ever been close to you, they're all gone, you find that success is a little unfulfilling. So what do you do? You fucking kill yourself, that's- what? This is a wrestling video game, what? You blow your- the ending to a wrestling video game is that you go home, wait a few days, and fucking kill yourself because success is unfulfilling with pe without people around you. What? Holy shit. Who hurt you, Suda51? Who fucking hurt you? So, I think it's pretty safe to say that this might be the most fucked up, the darkest video game ending of all time, but if you know of something worse, please, please let me know in the comment section. Until next time, everybody, don't fucking kill yourself, what?